Hi everyone, welcome to this Tuesday evening session from Med, Med Ed Goes On. Uh, my name is Rachel Seniger. I'm a, um, a doctor living in Newcastle um, and I'm a course coordinator for the medical program here at, UN, at UON. Um, today we're going to be discussing um, buddying and mentoring um, and we've got Anthony Lu Anthony Llewellyn here. Um, he's one of the two co-founders of Advanced Med um, and he's a consultant psychiatrist with extensive medical education and medical human resources experience. Um, I um, know Anthony both as I've worked with him in Advanced Med and also as I've worked with him in Hunter New England Psychiatry um, and together we worked um, on HNAP, a successful mentoring um, program for junior doctors interested in psychiatry. So. Very, very good to have him talking about this today. Um, just to get us started on the welcome page, um, feel free to ask any questions, ideally if it's general. Um, I'll be moderating the chat, so feel free to use the chat at any point in time, um, and I will um, pose those questions to Anthony as they seem relevant with the content. Um, we're gonna be having some poll everywhere um, um, interactive content throughout the session as well. So have either a smart device if you want to use your phone or you can also do that through your computer web browser here as well. Thank you, Anthony, for posting that link. I'll post it again a little bit later in case we have anyone else come along. Um, um, but yes, that's probably enough to get us started. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks, Rachel. Um... So, and thank you for helping with some of the mentoring in the past as well. Um, so hi guys. Um, so it's our second virtual lecture as part of the taking the JMO series online. Um, I hope you get a lot out of this. I've tried to make this really interactive. So as Rachel says, there's, um, you can ask questions at any point in the chat, um, but also we've got the poll everywhere. So um, we're going to test it out shortly, um, but that's a way of interacting with the talk. Um, so the reason we chose this topic for number two is that there's been a lot of discussion in the last couple of weeks, month or so about um, the possibility of some medical students being um, repurposed, I guess, uh, in, into different roles in the hospitals. And uh, it may be that for each of you in the next month or so, you turn around and all of a sudden there's a buddy attached to your hip, um, which could be really super cool and useful, but does come with some challenges and um, I think it's worth thinking a little bit about how do you get the best out of a buddy and how do you help someone new into the hospital? For, for many of you, you're kind of still new uh, and you can probably sort of look back on your orientation and think about what went well, what didn't go so well, what would you do differently? Um, you're actually the experts at this and um, I think uh, this can be a really powerful experience um, if you can buddy up successfully with someone because the evidence shows that that can really make the difference um, for a new employee in any industry, but I would think in a hospital, particularly in, in 2020. So let's test out this poll. You may not be able to see at the top, but um, the URL is there, but we've put it in the chat as well. So pollev.com backslash mededhelp. Um, just to see that it's all working, if you can put a little um, placeholder on the, uh, on the map and we'll see where you're all from. Um, so I'm gonna try another poll. Um, now they've got the hang of it. I'd just be interested to know, at the moment, do you have medical students on your wards? Because there's a lot of places where they actually aren't on the wards at the moment. They've kind of been kicked off um, for a bunch of reasons. Now, it could be that they're on holidays, but um, I think in most cases, there's possibly another reason. So that's interesting. So about 82% three quarters, don't have medical students at the moment. Interesting. Cool, cool. So um, I'd be interested to know uh, what's happening with the medical students where you, where you are. Are they, do you just not normally have medical students or, um, or uh, you know, have they been deliberately told to go home? Uh, the, the medical school's kind of thinking about Yep, online learning. Or, you know, what were the reasons that you were told that there couldn't be medical students anymore? Some of the things we've heard is that this is too risky. 
Um, you can't do social distancing in the hospital. I've been given some, um, you know, things like, you know, the, the wards are um, too crowded to have students in the, um, in the offices and things like that. Okay, on relief doing nights, hence don't see medical students, yeah. That's one of the advantages of being a medical student. You usually don't have to do nights. And in the chat, we've got some have been relieved from college and hospital duties. Yeah, yeah. So this is a big issue, really, isn't it? I mean, um, it's not just, I mean, we started this med-ed goes on because we were worried that, um, you know, for a bunch of reasons that the face-to-face -face training that you normally have as interns and residents was being cancelled and it needed to be replaced in some way, shape or form. Well, um, this sort of stuff's happening across the medical training continuum. I mean, at the consultant level, conferences are being cancelled. <laughs> at the college training level around the world, college selection and college exams have been put on hold. Um, uh, there's some some suggestion that maybe the annual medical recruitment's going to be a little bit delayed. Um, and lots of medical students are either not at hospital doing their placements or in some cases in some of the parts of the world where they're a little bit ahead of us in terms of COVID, um, they've just been kind of turned into, you know, either this assistant in medicine kind of role, this sort of pre-internship role. Well, I've heard a lot of um, cases where medical students have, um, like in the United States, are actually at home looking after the kids of the doctors that are actually in the hospital dealing with the COVID, et cetera. Um, so this has got some really major consequences downstream, you know, because you know, we obviously, if we don't have, um, particularly the final years, graduating at the end of the year, we don't have new interns to come into the system. So that's going to create some problems as well. So this is why the AMC, the medical board, the health services, the medical schools are all trying to think of what's the best way of getting students back into the hospital. And one of the suggestions is to change things around and have them more attached to the team in these sort of um, perhaps, you know, formal roles employed as assistants in medicine or pre-interns or just that the experience would be more extended and a kind of a true pre-internship, but that one of the ways of making sure that they were safe and looked after would be that they would actually be more closely working alongside, say, a resident or intern or a registrar or something like that. So that brings us to the topic of buddying because buddying is kind of, in my view, very crucial to, to helping any new employee into an organization at the best of times. And uh, I guess because we don't know when the medical students are coming back, in some cases they've come back already or they might be having next week or the week after or whatever, um, it's going to be a little bit hard for us to kind of just be scheduling uh, sessions for teaching you how to be a buddy and doing it the kind of normal way that it would happen. Um, as someone mentioned in the chat, some of the medical students have already had like a week's orientation. And so that would be the normal time that you'd start to introduce a buddy program, for example. You know, on the last day, you'd probably introduce the new doctor to their buddy for the next little while. Um, so buddy programs are kind of, they're not meant to last forever. Um, uh, and they can sort of last anywhere between, say, in some cases, even like a few weeks or days, um, but more properly, usually around a few months, like three months up to 12 months. And studies show that um, it's really important that you get those first few months uh, right in any industry, but I think this is the same for hospitals as well, um, that if, you, if, you, if the employees kind of get a good experience, um, that's going to be really helpful to make up their mind. Now, you know, some people take up a job and they kind of hear one thing and the, the, they're told something in selection, etc. and the reality is completely different. Um, but often, um, often the reason that people don't uh, continue through with a job is because those first few early days, months don't meet their expectations. Uh, and so having someone alongside you to help you show you the way and do some of those kind of things that, that aren't covered in the formal orientation, like teach you the tricks and tips around the hospital and who to talk to and how to grease the wheels and all that sort of thing can be quite crucial. On the flip side, they've done studies around the fact that when employees, basically when employees decide that this job's not for us, for me, that usually costs a bit of money. Because if you think about it, it's costed money to hire someone and train them up and then they leave early. So you've got to do all over again. So they, I don't know how they came up with a $37 billion figure, but they worked out the cost of um, not getting it right basically, was really quite a significant um, cost across two countries in jobs. So 
it economically makes sense as well to have things like buddy programs to reduce that sort of early turnover. So buddy systems basically partner an existing employee with a new employee. Um, but it's a little bit more than that um, because it's about guiding them through the first few weeks or months on the job. And as I've said already, it's not necessarily the, the best to uh, pair up like a, an intern with like a consultant because, you know, consultants have been in the hospital for 20, 30 years and they've forgotten all the basic things of what it's like to be an intern or it was so long ago that it's changed so much. So it's actually about picking someone who, picking the right expert. And in this case, the expert is really the person that's just mastered the job, if you like, because they're the most likely ones to know how to show people around, basically. So you guys are actually the experts for buddying. Uh, and so one of the things I'm going to emphasize in this talk is that you might be enrolled in a buddy group, you might be asked to do certain things for your buddies, etc. But challenge and question some of the things that you're being asked to do. If it doesn't actually seem right to you, because you know a little bit differently, you probably are more of an expert in this and you should speak up and say, look, I don't think we should be showing them how to do the cannulations in the first week. Let's focus on they're getting them to find the ward list and uh, understanding where the patients are. And, um, and then we'll do the, the cannulations sort of week two or something like that. Okay. And so um, something that often comes up when we talk about budding is mentoring. So I thought it'd just be important to kind of touch on what mentoring is and what the difference might be. And really at the end of it, I mean, it, it, there's a, there's a few things that are different, but the most important thing in my mind is the fact that a mentoring system is a bit more of an extended relationship. Um, buddy systems aren't meant to go for very long. Mentoring systems can often be a little bit, uh, it will define in terms of when they finish uh, and they often can go on for a few years at a time. Um, and so that's often, we often see that as, as Rachel pointed out um, in the programs we've run in psychiatry. Often you might see, say, when you're a specialty trainer and you start off as a basic trainer, you might be given uh, a registrar who's like three or four years above you and they kind of hopefully mentor you the whole way through your specialty training um, if it works successfully. So that's kind of an example of that. Um, and so they tend to, mental relationships tend to be a little bit more deeper eventually because of that nature of the length. So let's have a little pause again and we'll put it over to the poll everywhere. I'm just interested to know is, has anyone been buddied or mentored before? Yes or no? Or I've also put not sure because I think in a number of cases, these systems are put in place and people don't really know that there's been a buddying or a mentoring system. And like someone turns up and has a chat to them and they go, have I just been buddied or mentored? I'm not quite clear about it. Okay, so quite a few people. Excuse me, having a drink there. So it sounds like most of you had some experience of being buddied or mentored before, which is good because you kind of know what it's like from the protege buddy role, um, which is good. So my next question then is, if you have been buddied or mentored before, was it helpful? And uh, I haven't got a slide on this, um, I don't think. I haven't got a poll on this, but maybe if in the chat, um, if, it, if it wasn't helpful particularly, I'd be interested to know why it wasn't helpful. Now, bearing in mind our community guidelines, we don't want to know people's names or <laughs> specifics, just sort of broad reasons why you found it to be unhelpful. Okay, 92% found it helpful. Excellent. Great, so I've sold you on the concept, I think, which is great. Um, so again, feel free to put some things in the chat. Maybe you might wanna say why you found it was helpful and we'll come back to that too. Um, I just wanted to highlight that um, this was a paper I found from last year actually in the MJA where they, um, it was a Perth group um, and they basically did like a non-random, like well, non-blinded, a randomized trial where they stuck some of the new interns with mentors and others not basically. Um, and they showed that they could actually measure some pretty um, uh, good impacts. Now I'd probably call this a buddying program from what I've read of it, but you know, you can argue that around, but uh, even close to home programs like this do lead to changes in terms of 
uh, impact on stress, morale, sense of support, job satisfaction, and psychosocial well-being. So you can go and have a read of that um, paper if you like. But you know, there's a little bit of medical scientific evidence to back it up as well. Because often when we talk about budding and mentoring programs, we're taking it from the human resources literature or the um, places like um, um, business um, sort of journals, etc. Um, so we've talked about buddying and mentoring. There's a few other concepts that I think are relevant when we're talking about these things, just to kind of highlight again what budding isn't. Um, so I don't think buddying is supervision, um, for example. And in fact, if you're being asked to supervise and buddy at the same time, that could be a little bit of a problem. Um, and one of the things that I kind of recommend when we get to their tips is um, there needs to be someone else that can kind of um, be the kind of person of authority, if you like. Um, so you, you'll probably, um, a lot of the talk about the assistant in medicine program, for example, is around who does the medical student relate to in the team, but who's going to be the supervisor. And I think it's important at the end of the day that there's someone a little bit more senior to be the formal supervisor, particularly if things are not going right. Um, it's kind of hard to buddy someone and be positive and coach them when there's some serious performance issues at the same time. Um, for similar reasons, um, it's not really about coaching them. Uh, you might show them how you do things or show them where things are, etc. cetera. Um, but that's kind of different. And as I said, it's not really a long-term mentoring relationship. It might turn into that, um, but often what you're being asked to do is kind of just help them make a good, positive first start. Um, so some key considerations for a successful program, in my opinion. Um, and this, this might be where, where it gets a little bit interesting when we're sort of making rapid decisions, but um, it's important to select good buddies or mentors for the, for the, the new employees coming in. Um, and as I said, near peers are kind of the best people. Um, often you'll sort of um, read when you get into the HR literature that often they're looking for strong performers. Um, so, you know, like most valuable intern or JMO of the year type people. Now, obviously, obviously we can't have all the, just the top 10% of JMOs, whatever, however you measure that being the buddies. Um, but they also need to be experts in the role. So, you know, I guess part of the thing is you need to be kind of comfortable that you feel that a certain level of competency to provide this sort of um, support. Uh, and then you've got to pair people up. Um, and I think this is where it might um, uh, get interesting and probably, you know, um, because all the, you know, new, the medical students might be coming into these roles, it's going to be hard to know who's like different in terms of capability and experience. It's going to be hard to sort of pair up the most experience with the least experience type of concept. Um, so again, that might be a little bit, um, you know, needs, needs a bit of tinkering at, at times. Um, uh, I mean, ideally you would pair up the, the best buddies, the p people are best at budding with say the ones that are, the students that are lack, um, lacking in, in confidence a bit, uh, how you go about doing that um, might be interesting. And maybe we need to think about are there opportunities to swap uh, around a bit. Um, again, that might be a little bit tricky because one of the concepts for these programs is sort of, as I said, embedding <laughs> or attaching a medical student to an internal resident and not necessarily swapping around. And of course, you guys, a lot of you are not swapping too. Um, so we might not be able to do much about the pairing, but what we can do is provide more training and support. And I think this is crucial that you don't just ask a buddy to go and pair up with a new doctor and say, here's a checklist or here's some ideas and go away and do it. Obviously, um, one of the things that are being thought about with the medical students is ongoing support for their role. One of the things we're thinking about at Newcastle here is that the interns and residents should also have their own access to supports. Um, maybe chances to get together regularly and talk about how it's going being a buddy um, and looking after someone new on the ward and sort of working out some of the issues. Um, and obviously getting regular feedback and monitoring of the program is important too. Um, so Divish says that budding has given them uh, a new perspective every, every time, which is great. Um, so what should buddies do? Um, I think probably be explicit is, you know, um, talk out loud about what you're doing in front of this new person. Uh, uh, you know, ex explain the steps that you're taking. Um, don't, you know, 
don't assume any particular knowledge until you've kind of seen the person showing some confidence and saying, yeah, I get it. Um, so there's lots of things you can teach and explain. You can teach and explain the common tasks you do, like why it is that you start each day by getting the word list and um, spending 15 minutes writing numbers down and putting pathology against it or whatever you do. Um, why it is that you carry um, pathology forms around with you if you're still using pads or why you drag the computer around with you to order the pathology as you go around the ward round. Um, who all these weird people are in the ward round and what they do and um, how the hospital actually operates and how you can go and put in a, for a leave request, etc. cetera. Um, sharing insights about, you know, why it is that certain things happen certain ways. Importantly, and this, this is never really covered in an orientation program, you can help the new person socialise. Um, you can introduce them to all the key players. One of the hardest things when you're new is going around, even for extroverts, is going around and introducing yourself constantly to new people. I'm great with faces, but I'm terrible with names. Um, and so at a certain point, you get a little bit anxious when you're a new person. You don't want to offend people. You're sick of sort of saying, hi, I'm so-and-so, who are you? Um, so as the person buddying with someone, you can be really super helpful by actually just going around and introducing them to all the key people um, so that they know who they are and who to go to for certain things uh, and kind of, um, you know, uh, helping them to or helping the people you're introducing them to, to know that you've, you're a fan of this person and you'd like them to treat the new person with you the same way that they treat you. We've got a really good comment about that here saying to help them establish a norm of communication. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. And rewards. Great way to put it. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, that sort of stuff about how to get on, you know, like um, all that stuff that, um, that can make a, a big difference, you know, um, the sort of traditional intern resident thing of bringing in some chocolates occasionally for the rest of the team or, um, uh, you know, as someone said here, you know, thanking people for, for helping you, you know, we often kind of, um, you know, one, one of the things that stressful systems do, organisations do, is they get a bit critical with each other and we forget to say thank you for people doing a good job um, or just doing their job. Um, and, you know, that can be a real point of conflict sometimes. The, the nurses aren't, you know, they, they aren't paging you about someone with a, temperature just to be annoying that's their role and they're actually tell, trying to let you know that there's an issue that you need to go and check on and if they waited too long then the patient's going to crash and that's going to be bad for you so really they're helping you to do your job but often because we're rushed we're kind of being a bit rude or abrupt and we forget to say thanks or um uh you know thank you for letting me know so i can go and you know check on that um and respecting each other's roles so yeah uh, absolutely um um, High-performing teams, they've shown, uh, if you go and sort of study them, uh, there's usually about um, a ratio of five amounts of positive to one amount of negative. Um, they actually did this study in couples <laughs> initially, but they've done it in industries. And same thing in couples happened. They, they actually, um, there was a, a couple of um, therapists in the States that worked out, um, they followed these couples, they'd interviewed them, and just serendipitously they'd, they went back and counted and they worked out the couples that said five amounts of good things about each other to a ratio of one negative were the ones that stayed together. <laughs> um, and so then now, that, now they've seen this in teams as well. Um, so I think about, you know, how often do you kind of hear that's a bad job or you did that wrong or whatever and not necessarily just a thank you for that or that was great, good job, you know. Um, that can make a real difference. Now, we do have to tell people when sometimes when they've, not done things right. We need to correct things that are important. Um, but as I say, one of the best ways of doing that is balance it out with positive reinforcement as well. So yeah, really good point there. Um, so um, have, how have near peers been helpful to you in the past? We've had a couple of suggestions around that, but I'm just interested in thinking in hearing from, from you guys as to any other ideas, um, or maybe a better way of asking this is how have they been helpful in different ways to some of the more senior people in the hospital? Yeah, validation of common concerns, yeah. 
they're often good to go and turn to. And like, if you feel like you've been treated harshly by one of the more senior members of the staff and you're thinking, am I just being a little bit sensitive here? That can be a really good person to turn to. Um, providing perspective, yeah. Um, your near peers can kind of help warn you as well. Like, you know, you're going to a new term. What should I be expecting? What to watch out for? What does a consultant like? Um, what are their preferences? Um, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, is it, you know, even down to kind of watch out for the ward stock on that ward that's pretty highly disorganized. You might want to, you know, check that they've got all the gear you want, that sort of thing. Yeah, often more approachable than a more senior person. Absolutely. We've got here saved my back one too many times in front of senior consultants. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Strengths in numbers. Um, uh, yeah, look, I think one of the, you know, this is not a talk about bullying, um, but uh, one of the ways of kind of protecting each other from bullying is stepping in when you're the bystander. So near peers can kind of just walk in and go, look, hey, the new, uh, they didn't realise that we shouldn't, um, be charting that medication around here, that sort of stuff, you know, let's, let's cut them a break. Um, uh, yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, usually not expected, but well received. I think that's in relation to a couple of comments above the, um, thanking the team at the end of the week. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Scott. Yeah. Um, it's, um, yeah, again, you know, think, if you think about it, um, there's a whole bunch of people that take over from you whenever you st stop your shift, et cetera. And um, uh, particularly the staff working the weekends um, need a bit of thank you when you're leaving if you're not staying for the weekend. It makes me feel more confident doing my job to have extra support and guidance. Yep. Helped increase efficiency. Yeah, so this gets around to tactics, you know, like I think bosses, you know, don't don't ask me the the best way to kind of get through the patient list during the day. I'll have my own ideas, but it'll be coloured by what I think is important. Um, uh, you know, a resident or a registrar will be, have a much better idea of um, how to be more efficient in your tasks and, you know, what's, um, what's, what's absolutely essential and what is good to get done if you can and what can probably be left till the next day. Um, I think one of the things in medicine, particularly mental health, but probably in, in, in lots of medicine, you, you start the day with a whole lot of expectations and um, things that you'd like to get done, you know, family meetings, go over the someone's discharge plan. And sometimes it gets thrown out and you have to reprioritize. And sometimes it's okay to leave having done a good enough job. Um, it's nice to have days when you feel like you've done a great job, but if you can have a good enough job, done a good enough job that day, that can, that can be okay as well. Yep, great to bounce ideas off and get help for jobs. Yep, absolutely. All right, so my seven tips for being a buddy in medicine. Um, in no particular order, I don't think. Um, before I do that, what do you think are some of the key things buddies could do, particularly in the current environment? What would you, if you were told you're going to buddy with a new um, medical student intern next week, what would be the first thing that you'd be doing with them? What would you be doing when you sit, sit down with them on Monday and have a coffee? Two metres apart from them. Set the expectations. <laughs> so is that about, you know, clarifying what you're going to do and what they, they're going to do or what their limits are, perhaps? I think that's actually quite a good thing to, to, to talk about because, again, we're kind of this is an unprecedented role pretty much in Australian history. So um, they may be a little bit unclear about where their limits are and, and whatnot. Orientation team and ter uh, term and team. Yep. Yep. Validating from the start. I like that. Yeah. Acknowledging current stressful and unusual situation. Make them well feel welcome. Not as an extra, basically part of the team. Yeah. So in starting comment, off on a really good good note, yeah. Yeah. In the comments, we've also got um, forming the key objectives. Yeah. That they have a safety net. Cool. Excellent. So I think one of the things is to 
um, you're going to probably go, you know, I, I, I reckon most, certainly anyone on this talk tonight um, will be very positive and enthusiastic about this. And I reckon most doctors will be. Um, uh, question there. Uh, do you think students should be buddied to interns or residents? Uh, it's a good question because um, I've heard people suggesting that they should be formally managed by the registrar or the consultant or the intern or the resident. Um, I don't think it's going to be um, one size fits all suits every environment. And uh, I know certain hospitals are thinking, look, we're happy to have the medical students back, but we don't think now's the right time for these, these new roles as well. But I think we've got to get the medical students back in one way, shape or form. Um, in Newcastle, we're talking about them being attached to mainly the interns or residents because we think that's the best way of them um, relating within the team. They're kind of reporting, working with the person that's next above them. Um, uh, and it's probably going to be easier to hand off tasks that they can do using that relationship. Um, uh, but, you know, um, registrars are very good. Some are very, very good at supporting interns and residents. They could certainly probably support medical students too. Um, so yeah, I, I guess it's a, if the question is, do you, I think they should be because it's risky? No, uh, I actually think you guys know a lot about um, medicine and um, if, you know, we're, th there's a big agenda at the moment within medical school training to make, um, we're calling it, it making medical students work ready. The latest language has turned back to preparedness, but whatever you want to call it, um, it's about whether you're ready to be an intern or not. Um, uh, and I think it would be very silly to develop new training systems that didn't have some input from current interns or residents about what readiness is and, and whether medical students are demonstrating readiness skills. So um, I think the main risk there is sometimes you feel a bit close to the person, you find it hard, particularly if you thinking maybe this person isn't ready to let them know and or let other people know. Um, but on the flip side, as I said, you guys are actually the experts on what interns and residents do. So yeah, definitely I think it's a good idea to buddy them with interns and residents basically. Um, so there's a lot of suggestions there. Uh, and as I said, I think you're gonna be enthusiastic about all this. One thing to think about is, is there a potential to overwhelm someone, particularly in the first day in the first week or so um, and one of the concepts I've developed with um, some intern buddying programs is just maybe thinking about going back over things once, twice, three times, not assuming they stick the first time. Uh, and maybe thinking about, am I giving them too much too soon as well? Um, so which comes to my first tip, have a list. Um, now, you might be given a list from admin or someone saying this is what they need to do or as I've discovered in other systems, um, the, the person being buddied is given the list of things that they should check off, which I think is really not a very good idea. Um, I think the buddy should be in charge of the list. They should sit down with the, the new person and go through what they need to know and, and be in charge of making sure they really get it. Um, so you probably have some sort of list maybe provided to you, but feel free to add to it or reprioritize it. As I said, you may think some of the things on that list are not as important for the first day or first week. It might actually cognitively overload and, um, you know, affect the new person's confidence if they feel like they haven't done all those things this week. Um, so make sure you feel comfortable with the, the priority and the order and regularly check in with them uh, and make sure that they know it's okay to keep asking and that you really want to know that they've absolutely got it. Um, uh, and when you're going to have your catch-ups with them, you know, if, you know, presumably they'll have the list because they're working through it, but you've had input into it, make sure you refer to it and just sort of get them to bring it out again and go over it a few times. I did this once with um, um, some buddies, um, with some interns and some new interns, and I was actually quite pleased they, um, when I got the new, the new interns to bring in their list at the end of the week, um, that actually ticked most things three times, um, which was really good um, because to me that showed that they've really gotten the concepts uh, rather than being kind of um, uh, tokenistic, I guess. Um, 
Uh, and it's suggested in the chat that um, I, I've not, I've not, I, I know a lot of people are fans of Atul Guadney. I've read some quotes. I'm not familiar with the whole checklist manifesto, but um, uh, I'm assuming that's something about, you know, having a, a short list of things that you think are most important and making sure that um, the new person gets that, really gets those, those ideas. Uh, make kind of distilling it down to the key things, which I think is good. Um, so what would you put on your buddy list? What would you put on for like first day or first week? What would be super important or another way of thinking about it? What wouldn't you put on there? And then, you know, make some choices <laughs> where good coffee is. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Very important. It is. Otherwise, nobody's going to be efficient. No, absolutely. Have you had lunch? Yes. <laughs> Bathrooms and break spaces. Excellent. Yeah. Have you got your keys yet? <laughs> Show them around the hospital where things are. Yeah, absolutely. So no noticing nothing here is medical at all, which is great. I'm really impressed, guys. <laughs> Because I would have probably had a lot of this in the orientation week already. What are important players? Yep. Um, even take like even take them to those people. Like the uh, introduce them to the person who does the rosters if that's important for them. Or um, uh, if they haven't met the DPET yet, go out of the way to introduce them to the DPET and say, "Hey, this 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 doctor here is super supportive of us." Where to go, who to talk to if you need help, yeah. We've got a reference in the chat to making sure they've had a good night's sleep as well. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of sleep. <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, look, it, I guess it's going to be, you know, stressful for new people. Um, from what I've heard, um, the, the medical students on these uh, AIM jobs or what others um, are probably not going to be asked to do nights. Um, and again, this is probably a good reason to pair them up with an intern because generally interns aren't required to do nights much. Um, uh, so hopefully they won't have at least been doing a night shift so they should be able to have a reasonable chance to sleep. But they might be pretty stressed, so that would be important as well. Cool. All right. Um, patients, give the right ship time. Uh, I have this thing of kind of asking three times. Um, uh, often when you're, you know, when you're developing a relationship of trust with people, uh, even if you might be very clear in a near peer, um, the person doesn't know that you're serious or that they can trust you the first couple of times. So uh, I've certainly done this in my, you know, very supervisory relationships and manager relationships over the years where I'll set up regular meetings where it's a chance for uh, the doctor or the staff member who reports to me to kind of tell me how things are going and what I can do to help them, that sort of thing, the typical kind of good manager sort of protocol. But invariably, the first couple of times it's going, oh, everything's okay. Yeah, no, no problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the third time I go, no, tell me, what, what can I do to make things better? And I finally go, well, actually. <laughs> so usually you have to develop that trust. So you have to kind of ask a few times before someone's going to open up and say, look, this is a little bit... Um, embarrassing uh but when i was a medical student i kept stuffing up cannulation is there a chance we could get, kind of you know go over it a few more times because I, I feel like um that's something I, I still need a bit of help with um you're obviously trying to develop this psychologically safe place um so the idea that you can make mistakes we're here to learn um obviously we want to have some insurance around the types of mistakes being made, but um, that you're not going to criticise them for not knowing something, uh, and so they can speak up. You know, being open, not judging, that sort of stuff. Uh, and I like this this concept of psychological safety, which comes from the Centre for Medical Simulation at Harvard. Um, oh, I've tried to learn this so many times, but it just kind of doesn't stick. But I like the concept. Um, that's why I have slides for it instead of trying to learn it. But um, I think this is a really good kind of um, framework to have when you're working with someone junior and you're trying to develop them. Um, so their concept in simulation is that every doctor or um, in some uh, 
the, this is a medical sim, but you know, every staff member is intelligent, capable, cares about they're doing their best and wants to improve. So even if you're seeing the wrong behavior, we're trying to take a positive lens and say, well, they're doing it with good intent. So let's explore. Let's not, you know, go in and tell them, no, um, you didn't chart that properly. Let's find out why it is that they charted the medication that way and maybe assume that someone else taught them differently or, you know, there's another reason why um, uh, they did something the way that um, isn't supposed to be done. Um, then there's the experts curse. So you are the expert uh, as um, of being an internal resident, but you're not the expert on everything. Um, apart from perhaps who else to talk to. <laughs> so um, don't you know, feel you know don't feel like you have to have an answer for everything. Um, if you don't know, show them that you don't know and tell them it's okay to not know. But um, have a think about you know if I if I do need to get them in touch with someone else to help. Who's that going to be? Now, the most obvious thing is probably going to be like a registrar or consultant or a director of training or something like that. Uh, again, though, that could be a little bit confusing, particularly as well, these programs are being bedded down. Um, one thing that's being talked about is this sort of shared relationship thing where the medical schools will have some, uh, still have some ownership of the students and some involvement. So it may well be that there's like a medical school faculty member that um, you can go to to talk to as well. Um, slow down, don't try to cover everything at once. Um, important tactical information like where the coffee is, where the, the toilets are, how to get your roster in, how to make sure you get paid or the fact that no one ever gets paid properly the first time around. Um, that sort of stuff uh, is important to come first. Um, then maybe some of the clinical protocols, just sort of start <laughs> introducing some of that stuff towards the end of the first week or so. Um, and then deeper discussions will come. Uh, at a certain point, you know, your protege will notice weird things that, um, about the way the hospital works that kind of conflict with what they were officially told in orientation. And it'll be your job to kind of break that down and explain the hidden curriculum at that point in time. Stay positive. It's infectious. Um, new doctors will grow into their roles if they have someone coaching them on and cheering for them. Um, and especially hearing all the bad stuff early on is a real downer. Now then there's, there's always bad stuff and there's always reasons to be, you know, to be critical or, uh, but, you know, think about whether that's going to be helpful to tell them the reality of the situation first up. Um, you know, they'll find it out eventually. That'll probably come in a bit later and maybe they'll be a little bit more prepared to discuss um, some of those things and you know you can kind of validate them yeah look I think the way that particular team works is not the best um, they're a little bit rude when you ask for a consult you know we've noticed that as well but here's a few ways we've managed to get around that or deal with that or, or what have you um, I remember when I was a resident covering in neurosurgery for a few weeks um, one of my jobs pretty much every morning was to go down to MRI and ask for a scan uh, and every morning I would get some um, interrogation by the radiologist um, and told that I didn't need the scan for the patient. And I had no idea why that was, but I soon realized that the best thing to do was to go down there with the form, with the neurosurgery registrar's <laughs> number on speed dial. And as soon as I got into a point in the conversation where I couldn't get the scan, I just put the, ph put the phone over to the radiologist and um, he would sort it out. And he understood that that was, um, you know, me needing some help. So, um, you know, there, there, are, there are ways of explaining to people how to make good out of the system that we're in as well. Um, think about the problems that might come up. Um, uh, a really good resource is the Heady Training and Difficulty uh, Guidebook. Um, a really quick read. Um, it's one that Scott will vouch we get all the DPETs to read and uh, often registrars are encouraged to read it as well. Um, it's free online. Um, so if you ever get stuck, you think, well, oh, this person I'm working with is a bit down or depressed or whatever, and you're kind of wanting to sort of think, how do I sort this one out? Um, there's a resource for you. Um, and I think, as I said, I think it'll be good to have some peer review. Uh, hopefully that'll be formally done if these sort of programs are rolled out. Um, but um, maybe you need to kind of get your own group together, um, if not. Um, 
and always it's not your it's really not your responsibility it's your responsibility to identify fi oh thanks rachel's put the link in the chat there um it's your responsibility to identify when there's problems but it may not necessarily be your responsibility as a buddy to sort them out you can have a go but there's probably going to be some limits and so again you need to be clear about who you talk to if things aren't going exactly the way they should be and then the final thing is i I don't know how we're going to deal with this, but I actually think maybe budding is not for everyone. Um, there are probably some times when you should opt out. As I said, if you're the super formal supervisor of someone, you probably can't buddy them at the same time. Uh, if you feel you're just too inexperienced or you don't have the time, or maybe you're not passionate or maybe you're in that kind of really negative space where, you know, you've been um, doing a really hard term and all of a sudden you're doing it again for another term and, and whatnot. Um, I think we rec need to recognise that um, you can't force these relationships on everyone. Um, so again, I'm not sure how we're going to particularly deal with that. Um, uh, with with some of the ideas that were floating around getting medical students into these roles, but um, maybe there are some solutions where perhaps students are paired with the interns, but um, maybe there are you know maybe there's uh, sort of other buddying relationships some um, if the particular intern doesn't kind of feel that they can provide that level of support at this point in time. Um, time and model solution, walk down in person to radiology, neurosurgeon, ED, etc. Yep. <laughs> so I think that's kind of um, going with the, the new person and, 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 um, and getting their back. So that's good. Um, um, people are generally nicer in person than they are on the phone. <laughs> they are. That's true. That's true. So before we leave tonight and um, before my lights go off at eight o'clock, which they may do, um, I thought I'd just kind of give you a couple of scenarios to think about and maybe um, suggest some, some ac uh, actions around this. So let's imagine that you are indeed budding a new person um, and it's the first day and you've sat down with them and had coffee and shown them where the toilets are and told them that they can, they've can they got it and it, it'll be okay. And they say to you, look, I don't think I'm going to be able to remember all of this. What would you do? What would you prioritise in that situation? So basically the, the new doctor is saying, yep, um, saying that there's, they're just overwhelmed. Make the priorities together. Yeah, great. Yeah. Maybe even just say, look, you just follow me around for the next couple of days. Um, reassurance. Yep. <laughs> reassurance. Yep. Maybe a bit of normalising and validating. You know, I was like you. Um, teaching organising tools. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I'd, I'd like to su I'd suggest maybe not day one. <laughs> that might be kind of, you know, making them feel like they should have learnt that already. Um, perhaps um, show them that the, they're actually competent uh, in a couple of things. Then maybe bring in the, you know, the, the Eisenhower grid or whatever your organisational tool is for prioritising. Yep. Um, one of the issues with lists, by the way, is lists can be helpful, but there's lots of studies that show that unorganised lists can actually be unhelpful um, because what often happens with lists is they just get longer and longer and longer. Um, and so you're starting to look at this very long list <laughs> and it starts to depress you. So you need a prioritising system for your list. Um, uh, and if you're not familiar with the two by two Eisenhower grid, um, go look that one up. That's kind of the, the common one for, for prioritising your tasks and working out which ones actually don't require your input. Yep. Two good ones in the chat um, worth looking at as well. So um, one of them being to empower them mm -hmm. is a really good first step. Mm. Um, to let them know some personal experience. Um, it's a great way to build rapport, isn't it? Yep. And um, another good point from Scott here that not all mentors and protégés will click. Yep. So letting them know in some way, shape or form that there's an option to switch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, there are ways of matching people up based on 
interests and things like that. I'm not sure that our systems are going to be agile enough to do that in the first place. So again, it's going to be interesting when, um, and I think this will never really happen, uh, but, um, but I don't think we can just assume that we can bring in, in medical students and attach them to a, um, a particularly internal resident and that's going to work 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, so maybe we will have to do a bit of switching around. There'll be some clashes and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think it's good to have an open environment to say, look, it's important to bring those things, things up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, maybe you can kind of send them off to do something that you know they, they can do to build up their confidence and just get them to focus on those things first and do that. Good job, good job, good job. Um, and then, build up on it um, and, and make it clear that they're not expected to know everything straight away. Okay. Um, so let's, so I'll put this scenario for, cause I've used it before in another talk on this, and maybe this is not as appropriate to this particular situation, but let's say that you've had a week with them uh, and you are going to be split up. Um, and so you're having a conversation at the end of the week and they say, thanks. You've been very helpful so far but I'm about to go join another team. How am I going to get on next week? What might you do in that situation? Maybe you've been, you know, you're going to go off to go do nights and they're not allowed to follow you or something like that. Introduce them to the next person, absolutely. And more than that, actually upsell that person. Or, or even better, as Scott suggests, actually take them to that person and while you're walking, upsell that person and talk about how great they are and how they're just as good as you. Yeah. It's kind of like handover isn't just for our patients. Mm. Handover is for trainees as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Um, that's what good supervisors do. Yep. Yeah move into a longer term buddy system where they can still contact for general advice. Yeah. So just cause I'm leaving you, uh, doesn't mean it mean that you can't ask me for help. I may not be able to immediately pick up the phone at all times, but I'll be around. I'm still in the same, still in the hospital. I'll still take an interest, even sort of work out a time that you can check in with them again. Um, cool. Yeah. Be happy for them as they're advancing, uh, in another, another growth level. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. So um, that's crash course and being a buddy, guys. Um, it's it's as simple as you make it and as complicated as you make it. I think um, I think the complexity comes in the relationship and in getting to know the new person that you're working with. Um, but there are lots of simple things you can do to make it work well. And my emphasis is this, these systems are super powerful. All the good organizations like Google, for example, do this sort of thing because they know it works. Um, so, um, we do have another lecture on next week. Um, uh, but I'm happy to take some additional questions if, um, or comments around the topic, if you like. So I might just move to the next slide. Uh, but next week we've got Diverge Sharma, who's on the chat there, doing ECG interpretation. And then my next slide should give you some more polls, hopefully. No, it's not. There we go. Oh, no. oh, that's the feedback one. All right. Well, if you've got a question, put it in the chat. <laughs> It is. It's you next. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. I'm just going to fix my PowerPoint slides offline. <laughs> See where I put the other slide. Educational enhancement on the fly. <laughs> I do have another question, actually. You've asked them who's been buddy before. Who's been a buddy before? Who's already been a buddy for someone?
Hmm. Oh, there it is. Where's it going? Uh, I'm going to stop fiddling with that. There's something wrong with that that um, little slide, but yeah. yeah. So we have one who has been a been a been the buddy or the mentee um, or mentor rather, um, but for a group, yeah. Which yeah, buddying a group is an interesting concept too, isn't it? Yeah. And yes, as of yesterday. <laughs> so you're budding, budding as of yesterday, Aaron, are you? And thanks for the good feedback there, Ellie. Hopefully it's helpful. Anyone got anything that they're, if they're like as of yesterday, like Erin, or they think they're going to end up being a buddy next week, is there anything you're scared about or worried about or don't know what to do that you want to pick the brains trust while we're here? Or did you get given a list and did you look at it and go, there's some good stuff on there, but there might be some things I'd change. <laughs> a suggestion from Scott Murray, being a buddy is very satisfying. You feel your age when they get their first consultant's jobs. And then we become their patients as well, Scott. That's good. <laughs> One of the benefits of being a D-pet, at least your ex-trainees will treat you nicely when you're their patient. <laughs> or you become like me and you call on them to come lecture at the university. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Well, I think we've exhausted all the questions there. Um, so I'll leave, I'll leave Rachel to wrap up. <laughs> going to take over my job um, <laughs> okay thank you so much for everyone for um for coming on tonight um and contributing and and um interacting in our polls um and joining in on the chat it's been fantastic um looking forward to seeing you again next week for um ecg interpretation oh yes and anthony's mentioning here that it'll be um it'll be re replayed um um on thursday as well mm. Um, and the there we go. Anthony has lost his light. Um, and so on that, I think we will finish up. Uh, uh, how long do you have to present for, Divish? Around 45 minutes, if that's okay. Similar to tonight. Okay. If there's no further questions or anything, I think we'll leave it all there. That's Good weird. Night. Around me. All right. Ooh, yes. Ooh. <laughs> all right, see you guys. Thanks, Bye, everyone.